He's been too good. He's been too good. If you're missing it right now, get your praise. Get your thanks in. He's been too good. When it's more than just lyrics to a song. When you know you wouldn't be here without his mercy and his grace. When you get an opportunity to say thank you. God is so good. Thank you. Praise the Lord this morning. Yes. Come on, choir. Thank y'all. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Good morning, good morning. What a blessing it is to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Thank you. Thank you to our music ministry, our choir. Thank you to everybody that's serving this morning. Ushers, thank you all. Our media ministry. Thank you, Lord. It is so good to see you all on this Thanksgiving before, no, this thanks, this Sunday before Thanksgiving. There we go. This Sunday before Thanksgiving. It is good to see you all. Um, for those of you who are joining us virtually on virtual media, not social media, I'm going to get it together, y'all. Just pray for me. Um, I wasn't expecting that song, and it's got to reorient, got to bring myself back together. Um, but God has been good, and it's good to be here. I want to uh, just say a thank you, even though he is not here with us, to our pastor, the pastor, uh, Reverend Dr. Joseph C. Parker, Jr., um, the shepherd of our house. He is out today. Um, and pastor, if you are watching, know that we are praying. We are so thankful for you, and he is recovering from surgery, so we are just praying for a speedy recovery and healing for him. Um, I also want to say a special thank you to uh, friends and family that I have that came to support me today. Uh, all lovely here in the front row. My mom, my mother-in-law, my friend Julie and Davina, you all are amazing. I love y'all. So thank you for being here today. Um, and a thank you to my husband and his absence. He had another commitment today, but I just always have to publicly thank him for his unwavering support of my call to ministry. So before we get into God's word, will you all pray with me? Oh, Father God, creator of the universe, the Alpha and the Omega, God, you are so worthy of our praise. And so, Father, as we come before you now, I just pray that you would have your way. There is a word that you have for your people today. Um, Lord, I pray that I would decrease so that you can increase because this is all about you. We love you, Lord. We thank you, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, some of you who may not know me as well might not know that I'm originally from Memphis, Tennessee. And people are always shocked by that because I don't have a Tennessee twang um, until I go back to Tennessee. And so if I spend a little bit of time there, it'll come out. Um, but one of the things uh, us Southern girls have is that we were raised to have manners, right? We say please and thank you. Um, when someone, when we pass in front of someone, we say excuse me. When someone sneezes, we say oh God bless you. And when I, someone is kind enough to let me m merge into traffic or change lanes, you know, I give that friendly thank you wave, right? I was raised in the South with manners. And I am not quite sure what is happening in our society right now, but on a daily basis almost, I just feel appalled and offended by the lack of common courtesy and bad manners sometimes. And if I'm honest, it, it kind of grates on my nerves a little bit. And my biggest pet peeve, if I can be honest, is when people don't say thank you. And I'm gonna have to just say, y'all pray for me because this gets on my nerves so much that sometimes my response is involuntary. If I'm holding the door for someone, they walk through and don't say thank you, I might just automatically say, you're welcome. 
like I said, pray for me that my mouth does not get me in trouble. But there's something about a lack of gratitude that just gets under our skin. And the crazy thing is that, that expressing gratitude is actually good for us. Did you all know that November is National Gratitude Month? And there are lots of articles and blogs and different things out there that show the positive effects of gratitude. For example, in one study, it showed that a one-time act of thoughtful gratitude produced an immediate 10% increase in happiness and a 35% reduction in depressive symptoms. Regular gratitude journaling has been shown to result in a 5 to 15% increase in optimism and a 25% increase in sleep quality. When surveyed employees, 75 or 70 percent of employees would feel better about themselves if their boss were more grateful, and 81 percent said they would work harder. Gratitude has also been linked to improvements in health, like lowering blood pressure, strengthening our immune systems, lowering the hemoglobin um, 1AC, which is the glucose indicator for di diabetes. And so, in this season of gratitude, it seems fitting that we would just take a moment to reflect and give thanks to the one who is worthy of all of our gratitude and our adoration and our praise, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So as we examine this story of Jesus and the 10 lepers, I want to speak to the topic today of unafraid to give God praise. This is a simple story that we find here in Luke 17. It's short. It's just about nine little verses, but in these brief verses, we see some very valuable truths that can help us grow in our faith and our walk with Christ. We see that Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. And this is Jesus' last trip to Jerusalem. At the end of this trip awaits crucifixion. And on his way, he is met outside of a village by 10 lepers. And that leprosy is not something that maybe we talk about a lot in like modern medical terms. The Greek word that was used here actually could refer to a variety of skin conditions like even eczema and psoriasis or leprosy itself. But leprosy damages the skin, it damages the nerves, it attacks the limbs and the eyes, and it was thought to be very, very contagious in this period and was greatly feared. In the Old Testament, the book of Leviticus has two entire chapters, Leviticus 13 and 14. The entire chapter, over 100 verses, are dedicated to talking about leprosy. Leviticus 13, verses 45 and 46 say this, The leprous person who has the disease shall wear torn clothes and let the hair of his head hang loose, and he shall cover his upper lip and cry, Unclean! Unclean! He shall remain unclean as long as he has the disease. He is unclean. He shall live alone. His dwelling should be outside the camp. I can't even imagine what that might have been like to experience and to live in that space of being cast out completely from your community, not allowed to see your family, not allowed to go and be a part of the synagogue or worship in the temple, having to yell unclean everywhere that you walked around. How demeaning and depressing and completely demoralizing. There's not much detail given to us about these 10 lepers. Who knows, they may have loosely formed like a small leper community. Maybe they looked out for each other or maybe they just all happened to be there, cautiously lingering outside of this village, just hoping for a miracle. Now, Jesus had been traveling, he'd been teaching, he had been performing miracles, you know, he was doing all of the things that Jesus did. And the scripture doesn't tell us how these lepers knew about Jesus. Perhaps while they were sitting outside of the town, they just heard travelers, passerbyers, talking about this man named Jesus, this Jesus who had cast out demons and who had raised the dead and made the blind see and made the lame walk and had made lepers clean. In Luke 5, verses 12 through 15, we see the story just a couple of chapters before where we are here in Luke 17, where Jesus cleanses a leper. Luke 5, verse 12 says, While he was in one of the cities, there came a man full of leprosy. And when he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and begged him, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. 
And immediately the leprosy left him. And he charged him to tell no one, but go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing, as Moses commanded, for proof to them. But now even more, the report about him went abroad, and great crowds gathered to hear him and to be healed of their infirmities. There is no doubt that this story that we see in Luke 5 had spread. People had started to talk about Jesus. He was growing in popularity, and people were following him. There is a good chance that the lepers had heard about this this man named Jesus who touches lepers and makes them clean. So when these 10 lepers heard, these 10 outcasts, when they heard that Jesus was coming their way, they built up the courage to go and seek their miracle. And as Jesus approached the town, the lepers kind of maintained their distance, wanting to be respectful. They yelled out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And Jesus responds by giving them an instruction. He says, go and show yourselves to the priests. That was part of the Levitical law. The priest was the only one who could declare that someone was clean. But I want us to take just a little bit closer look at this. The lepers yell, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. And Jesus responds by telling them to go and show themselves to the priests. Sometimes when we ask Jesus for something, his answer is to give us an assignment something to go do. But watch what happens in verse 14. As they went, they were cleansed. As they went to do the thing that Jesus asked them to do, they received the thing that they came to Jesus for in the first place. They didn't know why Jesus said, go show yourselves to the priests, but they had enough faith that he could heal them. And that led to their obedience to what he had told them to go do, and that led to their blessing. This shows us this first kind of jewel, this piece of wisdom we can learn in this story, and it's that faith leads to obedience, and obedience leads to blessing. I'm trying to help somebody today, so I'm going to say it one more time. Faith leads to obedience, and then obedience leads to blessing. Often I think we struggle because we bring things to God with a predetermined solution. We come and we pray for this thing, and we know exactly how we want him to answer it, but Jesus is not a genie. Our wish is not his command. Sometimes when we come to God with something, when we come to him with a need, he doesn't just meet that need. He gives us an assignment. He tells us something to go do, requiring our faith and our obedience first, and then our blessing, and then our deliverance, and then our healing comes. My husband and I have been fans of stand-up comedy for quite a while. And a few years ago, we decided that we wanted to see the greats, like while they were still touring. So if they come to Austin, we go see them. We've seen Dave Chappelle, we've seen Chris Rock, and we even got to see Kevin Hart a couple years ago. And Kevin Hart shared a story the last time he sat down with Oprah that always struck me. He said that when he decided to pursue stand-up comedy, his mom said, okay, Kevin, if this is your dream, I will not be a dream killer. I will let you go and pursue this, but I'm only going to give you one year, one year to prove that you can do this and that you can provide for yourself. So Kevin talks about how he got into the comedy scene and he was, you know, making connections and meeting people, but he wasn't making any money. And so he came back to his mom and said, hey, um, I just need a little bit of help with the rent. And before he went off to pursue his comedy career, his mom had given him a Bible. So she asked, well, have you been reading your Bible? And he said, no. And she said, well, when you read your Bible, then we can talk about your rent. And so he talks about how a couple weeks went by. He's starting to get real anxious. He didn't want to get evicted. So he comes back to his mom and he says, mom, again, like, I don't, I got to get rent. You know, they're getting a little bit iffy with me. I'm not sure what's going to happen. She asked him again, are you reading your Bible? And he lies and said, yes. And she said, okay, well, let's talk about what you're reading. And he said, Ma, I don't have have time to be talking about the scriptures. I need my rent. And another month passes, and there's actually an eviction notice on his door. So he goes back to his mom, and he says, Mom, I I got this eviction notice. Like, I just, Ma, I, I need your help with rent. And she says, talk to me when you read your Bible. He says, man, I can't talk to you right now. So he frustrated. He goes back home, and he says to himself, man, let me just open up this Bible. 
And he opens up the Bible and six rent checks fell out of the middle of the Bible. And he calls his mommy and says, Mom, I'm so sorry. I just, yeah, I just thank you so much. And she says, you need to be reading that Bible so you can stay faithful in your journey. Sometimes when we ask for something, we're given an assignment. We have to go do something in faith and out of obedience to receive the thing that we need. And there may be somebody here today, you've been praying about something. You need an answer from God. You need God to move and work in your life. And God's told you something to go do, and you're kind of sitting on it. Because that's not the answer you really wanted. You just wanted him to answer the prayer. So I want to challenge and encourage you today to trust him. Because he is a good, good father. He leads us in the paths of righteousness, and his plan is always better than ours. So if he's telling you to go do something, I just want to encourage you today to step out in faith, be obedient to what he's told you to do, and see what he does. If we go back to our passage in verse 14, these lepers, they leave to show the priests themselves to the priests, and as they go, they're healed. Now, that must have been a sight. These 10 men starting off on their way, and, and all of a sudden, they stop and realize that their skin is clearing. That they're, they're not feeling the pain and the ache and, and all the things they've been feeling for all these years and the excitement and the joy and the celebration they must have had. They, they really had to get to the priest now. They had to go show that they were clean so that they could be reintegrated back into the society. They were clean. They were renewed. They were no longer outcasts. And nine of them rushed off to complete the task at hand and go show themselves to the priest. Oh, but one. There was one that in the realization of what had just happened to him, this one, he decided that there was no way he could take another step forward until he went back and thanked Jesus. The others were so overcome with the miracle that they forgot the miracle worker, but not that one. The scripture says in verse 15 that he turned back praising God with a loud voice and he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. He laid prostrate on his face at the feet of Jesus in total submission to praise and honor him and give him thanks. This miracle, being healed of leprosy, had shifted this man's entire life. He was an outcast, completely ostracized, cut off from his family, his faith community, completely destitute, but all that changed in this one moment. And then in verse 16, it ends with this interesting statement. It says, now he was a Samaritan. And why was it important to the author that we know that this man, this former leper, now cleansed, was a Samaritan? If you know anything about the scriptures, and Jesus actually talked about and dealt with Samaritans quite a bit, the Samaritans and Jews had a sordid history. It is too long for us to go into deep detail now, but what I can say is that the Samaritans had the Jewish law, they had the Jewish customs, but they intermarried with communities outside um, of their faith community, and they adopted some of the worship of their foreign idols and mixed that in with Judaism. And so they were worshiping God and worshiping idols. And this was something that the Jews who had stayed faithful, the chosen ones, the set apart ones, they didn't like. So that created a tension. It's all there in 2 Kings chapter 17, if you want to go read about it. But by the time that Jesus came onto the scene, the Samaritans and the Jews did not like each other. And the author makes sure to note that this man is a Samaritan because he wants to mark the significance of their history of hatred between these two groups. And yet and still, we see this Jewish man, Jesus, healing this Samaritan leper and this hated Samaritan lying at the feet of Jesus. The second thing that we can learn from this story, this truth uh, that we see come through, is that for Jesus, there are no outcasts. A familiar verse that I'm sure many of us who grew up in church learned in Sunday school was John 3:16. for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever, whoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. This interaction between Jesus and this Samaritan was going to leave an impression on everybody who was standing there and witnessing it. 
They were watching this unfold in front of their eyes and Jesus was dismantling their sense of self-righteousness, that they were able to determine who was and who was not worthy of being saved by the Messiah. This man was not an outcast to Jesus. His life matters to God. And we struggle with this. If we can be honest, we collectively, Christians, followers of Christ, we struggle with this. We place our own judgments on people and we somehow can have moments where we forget that Jesus came and died and was raised for anyone who believes. Anyone and everyone can be saved. He came for all, not just the Jews, but all of us Gentiles too, praise God. But what this means for us as we move throughout our day-to-day -day lives is that we have to remember that that person at our job that we don't get along with, Jesus came to save him too. That friend that betrayed us and told all our business, Jesus came to save her too. That family member who doesn't agree with us politically, Jesus came to save that person too. And then the way that we treat people should reflect that we realize that every person is worthy, every person is valuable, every person is an image bearer created in the image of the Most High God. And how could the world change if just the Christians, if just us would act like we believe that? every day. While this Samaritan man was laying at the feet of Jesus, face down, Jesus asked a question. He says, well, were not ten cleansed? Where were the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner, this Samaritan? He tells the Samaritan man, rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. One of the things that we will notice throughout scripture is that Jesus loves to ask questions he already knows the answer to. And he does this often for the benefit of those standing around, watching what's happening. And as I said, his popularity had grown. There were probably a small crowd, if not a large one, gathered at this point, watching this Samaritan praise Jesus. Jesus knew there were 10. Everybody knew that. He was trying to make a point. And the point that I think we can take from this series of questioning is that our gratitude and praise matter to God. And you might, you might ask, well, why? A primary reason that it, that it matters is because our gratitude and praise are an indication of the condition of our hearts. When Jesus was asked of all the commandments, which one is the most important? He responded in Mark 12, 28, or Mark 12, 30, by saying, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And the second of this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. He didn't say, love the Lord your God with all your efforts and all your striving. He didn't say, love the Lord your God with all of your accomplishments and your accolades and your degrees. The first thing he says is, love the Lord your God with all your heart. The condition of our hearts matters to God. That is the place that the gratitude and praise flows from. In Matthew 12, 34, Jesus said to the Pharisees, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person out of his good treasure bring forth, brings forth good. The evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. If we notice what the Samaritan did, he came back praising God with a loud voice and fell on his face at the feet of Jesus, giving thanks. This man's entire life had been transformed in that one moment in his encounter with Jesus. And this is the way that he chose to show his gratitude because he knew that Jesus was worthy of all of his praise. This man had done nothing to deserve his healing, and he recognized the depth and the significance of what had just happened to him. Our young adult ministry has been studying the book of Jude, a Bible study that was written by Jackie Hill Perry. And a couple weeks ago, as we looked at them in the lesson, she said something that struck me, and it was that grace isn't amazing unless you understood you didn't deserve it. When we know, when we know how worthy Jesus is and how unworthy we are, it should bring all of us 
to our face at the feet of the Savior. This man's story is not isolated. God has completely transformed some of your lives too. I know he's transformed mine. And I know I can't be the only one that God has pulled up out of some mess and saved me from my own deprived self. That is some of y'all's stories too. He is so good to us. And he is so worthy of our praise, our heartfelt praise, our unafraid praise. And you know, it's, it's funny as I was thinking about even just going to these, these comedy shows uh, that I was telling you all about earlier and how when they announce the comedian, everybody stands to their feet and they cheer and they, they clap and they praise and even the real quiet introverted people are out of the, their seat on their feet and they're praising the person who's coming to do the entertaining. And it got me to thinking, I mean, if we can holler like that when a Chris Rock or a Kevin Hart comes on stage or if you can holler for the Cowboys or whatever other team that you love, Surely, we as believers can shout hallelujah. If we can scream when people who bring us entertainment come out, surely we can praise and we can worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords with a loud voice of thanksgiving. That man didn't care about who saw him laying on his fate in front of Jesus. He was unafraid to give him the praise that he deserved. And you know, as a matter of fact, I'm just going to give you a moment to do that right now because I know that he's done things in your life that you can be thankful for, that you can praise him for. When the disciples came into Jerusalem and the Pharisees wanted Jesus to rebuke them, he said, well, if they be quiet, the rocks will cry out. And I don't know about y'all, but I'm not having rocks cry out for me. He has been too good. And if you don't know what to do, if you're reserved and you're just worried about what other people are thinking, let me tell you, don't worry about them. This is between you and Jesus. And if you don't know what to say, just say, thank you. Thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. You've been so good, Lord, and you're worthy of our praise. Hallelujah, Jesus. We thank you today, Lord. There are things in this room, there are miracles all over the place. There are marriages that have been restored. Thank you, Jesus. There are prodigal sons and daughters who have been brought back. Thank you, Jesus. There are bodies who have been healed. There are addictions that have been broken. There is depression and anxiety that has fallen off of people. So we just can take a moment and say thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Oh, Lord, you are so worthy. You are so worthy, Lord. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And I know that somebody might be thinking, well, Reverend Mary, I got, like, that sounds great, but I haven't had those things. Like, I haven't had those challenges and those troubles. Then just be thankful that he's kept you. That he's kept you from those troubles. Be thankful that he's protected you and he's fed you and he's taken care of you. And if, and if that's not enough, be thankful that while we were yet sinners, he traveled to Calvary for all of us so that we could be set free and receive the free gift of salvation. And this Thanksgiving week where we gather with friends or family or some of us might just take some time to rest and recharge and meditate. I want to encourage you all as we go throughout this week. As the world is saying, be grateful and be thankful and say the things you're thankful for that we not lose sight by thinking or being thankful for the things. That we not lose sight of the one who made the things possible. I want to encourage you just to take a couple moments this week and give God praise. And it doesn't have to be in a set aside time. It can be on your work, on your way to work in the car. It can be in the middle of your kitchen. When we sit in the reality of all that he has done, don't be afraid to say thank you. Praise God today. Praise God. Amen.